We are going to be beginning, be beginning this morning in 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 10. And we intend to go on in 1 Corinthians 14 as far as our time permits. We're looking at the superiority of prophecy in chapter 14. At the time 1 Corinthians was written, speaking in tongues was the least of all the spiritual gifts and prophecy was superior to speaking in tongues. Because of the abuse of the gift of tongues in the church at Corinth, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 14 to regulate its use in the church services. Remember that when 1 Corinthians was written, tongues and prophecy had not yet ceased. They would continue to be given for another 30 to 40 years. Even though the gift of tongues has since ceased, it is good for us to study these regulations because as independent Baptists, we are constantly bombarded by those who believe that tongues are for today. Whenever we discuss the subject of speaking in tongues, we must be careful to remember that in the Bible, speaking in tongues was speaking in foreign languages. It was not some unintelligible gibberish. It was the ability to speak a foreign language without having ever studied it. The gist of our text is this, Prophecy was superior to speaking in tongues because it edified the entire local church and not just the individual who understood that language. We have seen that because of its superiority, love is what really ought to be sought. But is, if someone is seeking after spiritual gifts, of all the nine sign gifts which were given at this time, the one to seek was prophecy. Verse 1 said, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. prophesy. We should remember, however, that gifts were distributed by the Holy Spirit in accordance with the will of God. So while you might like to have one of these gifts, if God the Holy Spirit didn't give it to you, you're not likely to get it. You understand that? Uh, other people should understand that. We've also seen that speaking in a foreign language edifies no one who cannot understand it. Verse 2 says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. We have furthermore seen by contrast that prophecy edifies, exhorts, and comforts. But he that prophesieth, speaking unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. In addition, we've seen that speaking in a foreign language which is not understood by the listeners edifies only the speaker, whereas prophecy edifies the entire church. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. How can that be? He knows what he's saying. He understands what he's saying. It's not some mumbo-jumbo gibberish. It's a language that he knows. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Then we saw that in order that the church might be edified, unless an interpreter or translator is present, Paul would rather that they all prophesy rather than speak in a foreign language in a church service. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. I wish you all had the gift of speaking in tongues, but I rather that you all had the gift of prophecy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, notice the phrase, except 
he interpret, unless he translates, that the church may receive edifying. In addition, we saw that the assembled local church will not benefit from someone speaking in a foreign language which is not understood by the hearers, whereas it will benefit from someone speaking by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by doctrine. Notice that revelation, knowledge, and prophesying all came as a result of spiritual gifts. But doctrine is not a spiritual gift. It is instruction or teaching. Moreover, we're in the process of seeing in verses 7 through 11 that to benefit from what is said, the hearer must be able to understand clearly the words that are used. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? for ye shall speak into the air. You're just wasting your breath. We continue with verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world is, there are perhaps so many kinds of voices in the world. And none of them is without signification means that none of them is incapable of conveying meaning or that every kind of voice contains meaning. Therefore, verse 11, if I know not the meaning of the voice unto him I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. What's a barbarian? A foreigner. Somebody who doesn't speak Greek. It, it isn't what we might have uh, in our thinking in, in modern English that he's some kind of savage uh, that would do terrible things. It's a foreigner. To benefit from what is said, the hearer must be able to understand clearly the meaning of the sounds or words that are used. You know, I've heard a lot of music in my lifetime. I've even heard some things that some people regard as music, which I don't share their view. But when I can't understand the words, it's a waste of my time. And in church, I've heard so many solos or quartets or choir numbers, and I cannot understand them. Now, I've got a pretty good understanding mind, but when I can't understand something, it would be a whole lot nicer in my mind if I could hear and understand what they're singing. I can remember being in chapel and having some guy uh, just going, amen, amen, really loud near me while somebody's singing a solo. Frankly, I can't enjoy the solo because of the interruptions. I don't know what the, solos, the soloist is singing. Uh, I used to refer to them as the, the barking dogs. You know, you can get a dog to bark if you tell him you're going to slit its throat. It doesn't matter. The dog doesn't understand you, and you just the way you say something. You need to be careful that we do understand what is said as best we can. I can teach this lesson on your level like I'm doing but I could not go over to the first graders in the Sunday school class and teach the same lesson over there with the same vocabulary. 
I'm not sure I could reduce it to their level. But anyway, it's important that we know what is being said. We've got enough troubles concentrating on it without not knowing what the vocabulary is. Therefore, introduces an inference drawn from the previous verse, and it's understood in the sense of then, consequently, accordingly, or so. So, if I know not the meaning of the voice means so, or therefore, if I don't understand, if I don't perceive, or I don't recognize what he's saying, and why wouldn't I understand what he's saying? It's because I don't speak his language. I shall be a barbarian unto him that speaketh, and he, shall, he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. It's I shall be a foreigner to him, and he shall be a foreigner to me. I do not speak fluent Spanish okay, or fluent German, or fluent French. In fact, I don't speak these at all. So if I go to Walmart, say, and I hear a couple of people speaking in some language that I have never understood, they can say anything they want in front of me, and I won't know the difference. And I may not care. But when somebody speaks English... I usually can figure out what he's saying. Once in a while, I struggle with that. We had some students when I was teaching at Ambassador that English did not seem to be their native language, yet they grew up in this country. Uh, they had this southern ease, and I'm not sure what you call it, but they sounded very foreign to me. I had to relearn some of my vocabulary terms when I moved to North Carolina. I shall be a foreigner. Well, you, you aren't going to understand a foreigner. As a result, we see that gifts should be sought that will edify the church in verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Even so ye is the same phrase Paul used in verse 9 where it was translated likewise. For as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts is because or since you, and it's plural, are enthusiasts of spiritual gifts. It indicates that the Corinthian believers really wanted to have spiritual gifts. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church, suggests be seeking the, edifying, or the edification of the church. The Corinthian believers were being counseled to be seeking the spiritual gifts which would result in the edification of their local church. As we continue... We see that one who speaks in an unknown tongue must pray that he can interpret because it will do nobody any good if he cannot be understood. Wherefore, therefore, for this reason, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue suggests the one who is speaking in a foreign language must pray. An unknown tongue means in a language which is unknown to the hearer, not unknown to the speaker, unknown to the hearer, not in some heavenly or holy ghost language which is unknown to everyone. Pray that he may interpret, pray that he may translate. The one speaking in a tongue or language may not speak the language as his audience. If he cannot translate what he's saying into the language of the audience, the people in the audience will not understand him. Now, it does not make sense 
that if he can speak in their language, he would be speaking to them in a language they do not understand. Rather, he would be speaking in the church service in a language they would understand. But if he can only speak in a language his audience does not understand, he must pray for the ability to translate whatever he has to say into the language spoken by the church people. It is not suggesting that he does not understand what he's saying. He understands it but his audience doesn't because of a language barrier. We see next that Paul will pray, sing, bless, and give thanks so that others might understand him. We see this in verses 14 through 17. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. If I pray suggests if I would pray. In an unknown tongue suggests in a foreign language, a language which is not known to someone who's hearing him pray. Of course, God hears his prayers and understands him regardless of the language in which he prays. My spirit prayeth means my spiritual gift is praying. Paul is uttering or expressing his thoughts and feelings, but not in a language understood by those who are with him. He's exercising his spiritual gift of tongues or languages under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He understands what he's praying, but no one other than God does. The phrase, my understanding, is unfruitful. It's literally the understanding of me. It means by this, People's understanding of me or people's understanding of what I am praying. It doesn't mean that my understanding, that I don't understand it. It means my audience doesn't understand it. And if that's the case, if somebody is praying in a language, the audience doesn't understand, it is useless or unproductive, it's producing no fruit because the people who hear him pray do not understand what he's praying. It does not mean that Paul would not understand what he's praying. Rather, it means that others would not understand what Paul is praying. People who hear Paul praying will not understand the content of his prayer if he speaks in a language which is foreign to them. What is it? Verse 15. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Paul purposes to pray and to sing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the exercise of his spiritual gift so that what he prays or sings will be intelligible to his hearers. What is it then? What is it therefore? Or so what is it? I will pray with the Spirit refers to Paul's expression in verse 14 where he wrote, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. And then the phrase, And I will pray with the understanding denotes with the faculty of, of physical and intellectual perception. And it means, I will pray with the mind. In saying this, Paul is not speaking of his own mind or his own understanding, but of the understanding of others who are present and hear his prayer. I will sing with the prayer spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. I will sing means that Paul will sing perhaps to the the accompaniment of a harp or he will sing praise. Its future tense indicates his commitment to singing not only with the spirit 
but also with the understanding. Paul will continue to sing praise with the Spirit, but he will always sing praise so that others might understand the praise he is singing. Similarly, if a musical group or soloist does not pronounce the words so that the audience can understand them, the audience misses some of the benefit it might otherwise have experienced. Verse 16, else what, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? In verse 16, Paul indicates that no one will be able to agree with the speaker unless he understands what the speaker is saying. Else is for otherwise. When thou shalt bless with the Spirit indicates that someone would say something which commends God in the sense of speak well of God, praise God, or extol God, but he would say it in a way which is foreign to the hearer. When introduces a condition. It's in Greek, this word is translated when is ordinarily translated if and should be understood in the sense of if in this verse. When or if thou shalt bless, when or if you will give thanks with the Spirit, suggests with the Spirit only, but not with the understanding. This blessing is not understood by others. It is in his exercise of his spiritual gift of tongues or of languages that he's giving this blessing which no one else who is present can understand. The question then is, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? How shall he say amen? In what way shall he say the amen? In what way is this person going to be able to affirm the content of this prayer? Now, this phrase, he that occupieth the room of the unlearned, is speaking simply of someone who does not understand the language in which the blessing or giving of thanks it has been expressed. He's unlearned in this foreign language. In other words, he doesn't understand it. You may very well be unlearned in Russian. I am. You may be unlearned in English. <laughs> then you're not going to understand the word I'm saying, okay? You're probably not unlearned in English, but it may be the only language in which you are not unlearned because it's the only language you may have ever studied. Maybe you studied something in high school or college that was required. Then you're not alone in English. He that occupieth the room of the unlearned is the one who does not understand the language in which the blessing or giving of thanks has been expressed. At thy giving of thanks suggests at your rendering of thanks or at your thanksgiving and suggests that bless at the beginning of this verse is understood in the sense of giving of thanks. We ask the blessing on our food. We are actually saying thank you to God for giving us this food. To answer this question, what we need to know is that the hearer cannot affirm what you have said in some language he does not understand. We understand this. It seems so, so uh, juvenile to keep saying these things, but apparently it was necessary for the Corinthian believers. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. For Thou verily givest thanks well, is for indeed you are giving thanks well. But strong contrast to thou 
verily give us thanks well. The other speaks of the person who occupies the position of the unlearned in the previous verse or the one who does not understand what is being said because of the language barrier. He's unlearned in this foreign language because he does not speak it and never studied it. The other is not edified. It means that he's not being helped to improve his Christian life in the sense that he's not strengthened or he is not built up. Have you ever been to a church service where you did not feel like you were edified or built up in the faith? We all have been. Don't you wonder why people keep going to churches like that where there is no content? So what are their minds doing? Uh, maybe their minds are just not paying much attention and are doing something else. Who knows? Although Paul exercises the gift of languages more than any of the Corinthian believers, he would rather speak in the church in a way which others can understand what he says. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church, you get that? He's not speaking with tongues in the church necessarily. I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue or in an unknown language. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all, is I thank my God speaking with the gift of languages more than you all. What is this gift of languages? Remember, it's the ability to speak a foreign language without having previously studied it. Okay? What was Paul doing throughout his earthly ministry? He was going from one country to another, to another, to another, to another, he went down into Arabia after he got saved. He went all the way throughout Palestine, up through Syria, across through what is today Turkey. All of these places had their own languages. He went to Greece. He went all over Greece. You understand? He met a lot of people that didn't speak his language. He spoke with languages more than the Corinthian believers spoke with languages. They stayed put most of the time. More than ye all. Where ye, as you plural, refers to the believers in the church at Corinth, it is comparing the use Paul makes of the gift of languages with the Corinthian believer's use of the gift of languages. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Yet introduces a strong contrast to what was stated in verse 18. It's the word ordinarily translated, but. In the church means in church, in a congregational meeting, or in an assembly of believers. I had rather speak is possibly understood in two ways. I'll explain them both, and then I'll tell you which one I prefer. I wish... I want or I desire to speak. It's always Paul's desire or wish. I had rather, however, may be more determinative 
than I wish, I want, or I desire and be understood as expressing purpose or resolve in the sense of I will to speak or I resolve to speak. Personally, I prefer the more determinative way. I resolve to speak. That is his intent, not just his desire. Five words suggests a very few words. Have you ever heard a preacher stop after five words? Not unless he died of a heart attack, right? No, he, we, we have a tendency to go on and on and on and on and say the same thing over and over and over again so that if you miss it in one place, you might pick it up in another. I'd rather speak Five words with my understanding does not mean words that I can understand. It means words with which I will be understood by others. Words that those who hear me can understand. That suggests in order that by my voice, I might teach others. I might instruct others of the same kind as I am. He wants to instruct believers. Also suggests that in addition to merely speaking with a foreign language, Paul wants or desires or resolves to teach others. Then makes the comparison between what Paul had rather do and what he would rather not do do. Now, you need to supply speak again in this text before the words translated 10,000. I had rather speak five words with my understanding than speak 10,000 words. Suggests a very large number of words in comparison to five words, which is a very small number of words than to speak in an unknown language, a language which is unknown or foreign to those who are my hearers. And he goes on into verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Be not children in understanding means stop being children in thinking. It suggests that they are not to be young, naive, or innocent in their understanding, but are to be mature or adult in their understanding or thinking. Understanding, although it's translated as a singular in the King James Bible, it's actually plural in the Greek text. It indicates the sum total of all the understandings or thinkings. And the word the appears before it in the Greek text and it might show possession in the sense of in your understandings or in your thinkings. Speaking of everything you understand or everything you think about. You should not be ignorant when it comes to your understanding. You should not be like little children in your understanding. Howbeit, it's a strong contrast to be not children in understanding. It's the same word translated yet in verse 19 and it's ordinarily translated but. In malice, in depravity, in wickedness, in vice. Be ye children. Is be as children, but it's not the same terminology translated be not children in the first half of this verse. There, it was speaking of ordinary children. Here, it is speaking of young children. The tense of be indicates that this is always to be the case. 
Believers are always to be like young children in relation to malice, depravity, wickedness, or vice. In other words, we are to be young, naive, or innocent when it comes to things that are wicked. We're not to be involved in them. There have been times in my life where I've had to have people explain to me what they were talking about. Okay, be careful. It's nice to be innocent and ignorant of some things. It bothers me when I hear some preachers talk an awful lot about a bunch of vices. And I mean by vice is not the kind of thing you'd use to hold something you're working on in a workshop. But I mean by that things that are sinful practices that people have. It bothers me to hear them know so much about these things and I'm, I've been around a long time. I don't even know what they are all about. I don't know some things. I'm glad I don't know. Ignorance might be bliss. We don't need to know all the ins and outs of what wickedness is. We're told here, be children, be young children in malice, in wickedness, but in understanding. Again, understanding is plural with the word the before it in the Greek text in your thinkings or in your understandings be men, full grown, mature, adult. You need to be understanding in spiritual things, but naive and innocent and ignorant in wickedness. Due to the abuses of the gift of speaking in tongues, the Apostle Paul found it necessary to lay down some regulations or limitations regarding the use of the gift of tongues in the local churches. If these regulations were enforced today, even present day speaking in tongues or speaking in gibberish would cease. You and I should never get involved in the modern day speaking in tongues in any way. We're going to have to stop here, but we will go on with the regulations or limitations in our next lesson. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of studying this portion of thy word it's often misunderstood. Help us to understand it and practice it in Jesus' name. Amen.